So he helps the Christians to focus not on the philosophy, but on the person of Jesus Christ. He says, walk in him. Because as you walk in him, this is the sort of direction that you are leading your life is walking, right? Leads you to direction, to a destination. Walking talks about a process that you keep walking with him to know him. And Paul went on to, to use metaphors of agriculture. Be rooted in him, just like a tree. You know, the roots get deeper and deeper. And then he used a metaphor of, of uh, architecture that the building will rise up you know, build up your faith, be rooted and be built up in Him. Just as you were taught by Him. In other words, that there is an engagement of a mental process. You have to be able to have an understanding to do that. Just as you were taught in Him, so that you abound in thanksgiving. You see what Paul is saying is that your life can be filled with joy, that you would thank God because you can be satisfied by walking with Jesus. And therefore, you do not need to be swayed by human philosophies and empty deceit. But you need to watch out. You need to keep guard because this can creep in. Just now, we, we sang about, you know, that I fully devote or belong to you like a bride to the bridegroom. And later on, Paul says, so that you, because you are filled in him. You see, you are completely filled in him. There's no lack in our lives. We are filled in Christ. Amen? Filled in Him. Filled with His righteousness. Filled with His goodness. Filled with His abundance life that He's promised. But you see, all the time from the Gnostics, at the time of Paul, where there was this division between the top story and the bottom story. This is where we need, as Christians, to understand that the two are actually integrated or must be integrated. That's why Paul says Jesus comes in, uh, uh, the whole of deity uh, fills him bodily. In other words, we should not compartmentalize what is spiritual and what is like physical. And Paul says, whether you eat and drink, you eat and drink for the glory of God. Because the moment you compartmentalize your life, you're going to separate out what is public and what is private, is what I'm saying. Uh, the, the things that, or what is spiritual, what is maybe not spiritual, you may see. Like in church, it's very spiritual. We all raise our hands and praise God and so on. But when you go into the world, you may behave like completely uh, uh, what the non-Christian will be doing. There's no fear of God in your life. You see what I'm saying? So integrate the, the physical, the natural, as well as the spiritual together. We should not divide up into compartmentalization. That's why Paul says that he is the head of all authority and rule. Jesus wants to rule over everything in that verse that we read. He wants to be the Lord of your life, of the lower story and also the upper story. So that whether you eat or drink, we do it for the glory of God. Because the moment you separate the two, you're going to have a crisis because you're not going to be consistent in your life. Because they say Jesus is Lord, on Sunday only. Maybe it's our group. But other than that, it is a struggle. Why? Because your worldview is not consistent. It's not coherent. And you will fall away, or you can fall away, because you cannot exist in an incoherent way. And I want to take us back a little bit to history as well, to understand how society or Western society comes into their philosophy today that also influence Christians. We know that the early church, you know, they have that relationship with Jesus. Walking in him, with him. But when the Roman Empire became Christianized, when King Con Emperor Constantine became a Christian convert, the church became very powerful, right? The church and state, they were interlinked. And so the once vibrant personal faith of Christians began to f gradually become lifeless, why? Because the church becomes an institution. They were embroiled in politics and so on. And people begin to follow Christianity more of a religion than that of walking with Jesus. We also experience that, if not careful. I mean, we can 
become religious. We follow a religion. Sunday, come to church. Friday night, go to cell group. Apart from that, you know, God is out of the picture. That's why Jesus is so much and dead against religion. He wants a personal walk with Him. That's why prayer, your time alone with God, is a good barometer, whether you're following religion or following Christ. Because if you do read God's Word, you do hear from the Spirit of God, you do spend time praying to Jesus on your own, then I know, and you know, that you're not following religion, but following Christ. But, but you, if you do not do that, and if you come to church and just do the religious activities, there is a danger that you're following religion. So here in the early church, it has become a state church, becomes lifeless. And so God becomes more and more distant. You know, the upper story and the lower story, you know, that gap becomes bigger and bigger. And over the years, until, you know, the, the 14th to the 17th century, called the Renaissance, it means a revival of culture. People start to, to, to go back to ancient uh, Greek literature, the, the Roman uh, literature and so on. Uh, they begin to, to say, look, we, we can increase in our knowledge. We can become a, a stronger culture. And with the discovery of America by Columbus in you know, 14, is it 92, and Copernicus, discovery that the Earth is no longer the center of the universe, people start to say, hey, we can challenge some of our established ideas. So science branched out to botany, to anatomy, to medicine. And the scientific method you know, helps people to, uh, in the process of discovery. This is how you discover laws of God. Now, the people there still believe in God, all right? Many of the scientists believe in God during those Renaissance uh, period, in, uh, those uh, centuries. But can you see that soon they see that God is becoming less and less personal, less and less relevant? As they see that the universe is, uh, is, is actually like a, a machine, that there are laws governing the universe. They're so excited that to, to them it's like God has... He's a, he's a watchmaker, you know, he just invented a watch, which is the universe. He, he, he sort of wound up the, the watch and he goes tick, 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 tick. He has his laws that you can explain. And he just simply walked away, no, no longer interested in the universe. So men start to tick things and say, look, maybe we cannot really know this God. He is unknowable, cannot be known, but he has given us the laws has given us reason. So truth can be discovered by our reasoning. So that, you know, moves on from the, from the age of re Renaissance to the age of reason, where they displace God with reasoning. He says God has given us the reason. We can reason. Uh, we can discover truth from reasoning. And then they move on as, you know, as, as science be be begins to explode, able to discover more and more things, explain away many things that people were superstitious about, then people start to say, hey, even reason is not good enough. Science is, 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 that's it. Science can explain everything. Science can replace God. And with the Darwinian uh, evolutionary theory, it gave an alternative. It gave an answer to say, hey, we, don't, we can explain the origin of life. We don't need God. And to people like uh, Richard Dawkins, they say, it gives me as an atheist intellectual satisfaction, an intellectual answer. Now, why am I saying all this? I want to guide you to say that there's a separation of the top story away from the bottom one. You see, until God is completely not relevant, even not necessary, just throw him out and just focus on the bottom story. So much so that in the 20th century, there's a guy called Ayer who wrote in his book, Language, Truth and Logic. He says that, look, he says all meaningful statements must be verifiable. Slide number eight. All meaningful statements must be verifiable. In other words, um, statements like God exists cannot be verified. You can't see him, you can't touch him, you can't smell him. You know, that's meaningless. Forget about that. Uh, charity is good. No, you can't verify it, so forget about it. So, 
So they, they start to uh, say this is a basis of really saying what is true and what is not true. But of course, why I'm saying this is because today people still use that theory, right? How can you believe in a God that you cannot see? You cannot taste, you cannot touch, you cannot hear. It is not verifiable, therefore it's not true. But do you know that this principle was challenged by philosophers to say, so how do you verify this statement is true? I can't taste it, I can't see it, I can't ex you know, smell it. And also, statements like, I'm not feeling well today, I'm feeling much worse today than I was yesterday. Is that meaningful? Yeah. Can it be verified? No, because you're the only one who says it. Or if you're a doctor, you say, in my professional opinion, the best treatment for this patient is chemotherapy. Can you verify that that's true? It may not be the best treatment. It's only your opinion. So it doesn't work, basically. So when you go into the world, when people challenge you, then you have to be able to have your gap, you know, fill up to say, no, it's not, it's not true. I don't believe that. And after World War II, you know, people started to uh, to even question, oh sorry, before World War II, uh, at the turn of the 20th century, there was this German philosopher, Nietzsche, who says that now that science and evolution have explained God away, there's really no reason, there's no purpose, there's no meaning for existence, right? You're just random. And if you can explain that this universe a cosmos is a closed system, which means that God cannot, you know, there's no external, like, God intervening. And everything is just operated by cause and effect. Then basically, men are not really free. We are just like a cog in a big machine. And what we think we have a will, we don't have a will. So the guy is, you know, starting just to think without God, what does it really mean to exist? And he's a very brilliant philosopher, but he eventually went to an asylum because he could not I don't know, can't, you know, get out of this loop, you know, infinite loop, you know, in our computer programming. So he, he basically said, hey, we are entering the age of absurdity, trying to get meaning out of a meaningless cosmos. And this was, uh, this was someone would say, is, a, is an age of alienation, of despair. Now, this is very important. That's how Western society has moved to an age of despair. And he says, we have killed God because of this. And God is dead. And out of this is today's Western society. It moves on to an age of existentialism. You need to understand that. Basically, what it means is that to, in order to get out of this meaningless and absurd world, man has to start to create his own meaning to live. His own meaning of his own meaning, his own purpose, is to find his own values. Each person has to find his own value. In other words, how you're going to live will define who you are as a human being, rather than the, the, the other way around, where as a human being, this is what you should be living, is what I'm saying. So existence precedes essence, right? You need to read a bit of philosophy on that one. And so truth is what works for you. There's no absolute, this is the important thing. There's no absolutes. Everybody discover your own thing. And everything, therefore, is relative. Have you not heard of that? Everything is relative. There are no absolutes. And of course, they pull in Einstein's theory of relativity, but that's really nothing to do with it. And you have to, do you believe that, who believes that everything is relative? Come on, put up your hand. Who does not believe everything is relative? Put up your hand. <laughs> not all of you, not sure. <laughs> you see, there are gaps. Because if somebody says everything is relative, you should ask a question. Are you absolutely sure? See? How can you say it's everything is relative when you are so sure? And out of this uh, comes out some consequences. I think firstly is individualism, right? Because everyone has to find meaning for himself or herself. And I have to ask myself whether individualism has crept into our church, into our society, where I want to do my own thing. I'm not accountable to you. 
is my right. And yet the Bible talks about we are a covenanted community. We are brothers and sisters, right? We are as close as your finger is to your thumb and to your hand. We are members of the same body of Christ. Have we lost something out of it? Because individualism from existentialism has crept into us. I'm even wondering why in today's society, you know, the children find it so difficult to talk to the parents. How many of you have a problem? Uh, don't put up your hand. Talking to your parents. My parents don't understand me. And the parents say, I don't understand my children. I wonder whether this quest to define meaning has also infiltrated into our minds. You see, I have to be myself. I have to find myself in this world. My parents, they are living in a different generation. He's a, they're different from me. You see, so very, like the, the, cut, uh, the, the video clip we watched, as if we are from two different worlds. Something to think about, whether our individualism has actually crept in because of this spirit of existentialism. Secondly, we, out of this consequence is, is uh, the need for tolerance, is it not? If everybody has to define his own truth, if everyone has to define his own values, if everyone has to define his own purpose, we're not going to agree with everybody. So you need tolerance, right? And the, 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 the one thing that society is pushing is that you must be tolerant. You cannot be a bigot. You cannot have absolutes. And you have to challenge that sort of thinking, right? Because you're going to say, look, if you believe in tolerance, are you able to take what I'm going to say to you? Right? You cannot say we must be tolerant and then you're not tolerant with my belief, with my belief in absolutes. You see, so you need to challenge that and not be held ransom because people accuse you of being a bigot. But you say, yeah, but you're not tolerant yourself because you only accommodate your view but not mine. Just because I believe in God, just because I believe there is an absolute right or wrong about things. And it's very easy that when you cut away absolute truth, when you cut away absolute value, when you cut away absolute purpose, as uh, R.C. Sproul, a theologian, says, what is left? What's left? As a human being, if I cut away truth, values, purpose from you, what is left? Feelings. Feelings. See? Debbie Boone, who's a daughter of uh, Pat Boone, who's a, a Christian, I and mean, she's a, a lovely Christian girl. She's famous for this song, You Light Up My Life. How many of you know this song, You Light Up My Life? Yeah? And inside that song is a line called, It Cannot Be Wrong If It Feels So Right. You see? I wonder whether a lot of our people today, sorry to say that, we are governed very much by feelings. And I'm not saying feelings are wrong. I mean, God gave us feelings. But can it be that because we do not think, uh, not that we don't think, I mean, because the, the, the mindset has been like, there's no absolutes, you know, you're just trying to look for everything. And then you just say, I, I can't trust even what I'm thinking. I just trust my feelings. That's why we are, in the Western side, maybe we, we, we are very feeling. Not feeling in terms of compassion, but feeling. But here, Paul, if you go back to the passage, you say, just as you were taught, there is a place of the mind. There's a place of understanding from God's Word. There's a place for wisdom, not just feelings, you know, but we need the integration of both, feelings and mind. So do not, like, therefore underplay the importance of uh, studying God's Word. You know, the Berians were famous for searching the Scriptures. And I want to talk about a little bit on hedonism, right? Just to move on. Because hedonism is a, is a form of a, a belief that it says that the, the highest good is pleasure. Maximum pleasure, minimum pain. Live for the now, all right? Don't worry about eternity. So these are some of the philosophies that cre uh, has crept into even the church, is it not? 
That sometimes we, what are our prayers? Oh God, help me this, get, get this maximum promotion with minimum effort. God, give me a pay rise, the biggest one, even without any justification. God, this life is too difficult. Help me to have an easy life. Now, I'm not saying it's naturally wrong to pray, right? Nobody would say, God, give me more hard work. God, give me less pay. You know, maybe that's a little bit wrong in your brain. But even Jesus said, Father, if possible, let this cup of suffering depart from me. Jesus didn't say, I love to go to the cross. He says, no, it's so, you know, it's so much of suffering and pain. If there's another way. But the important thing that for us Christians is, the Lord says, but nevertheless not my will but yours be done. And I think as Christians, we need to have that view. Just because God may not give you an easy way out, does not mean that God does not love you. But if you have a hedonistic view, then you say, yeah, God is bad. He didn't, he didn't make an easy way for me. Sometimes God may want you to go the hard way because He wants to prepare you for eternity. He's not so worried about your now that the world without God cares about so much. They live for the now. But we have to live for eternity. Prepare for eternity. And so, God may, instead of saying, Lord, take away this mountain, you have to pray, God, give me the strength to climb this mountain. I mean, look at Paul. He went through so much beatings, shipwrecks, uh, imprisonment, betrayal as a, a servant of Jesus Christ. Jesus did not make it easy, right, for Paul. In fact, when when Jesus called Paul and says, I would tell him that he is going to be my apostle and how much he needs to suffer for my name. Hedonism. The other one that afflicts the church is materialism. It's another worldview which says that we base our happiness on the abundance of our possessions. So we trust, put place our trust and security in money rather than God. And Jesus warns us, right, that be careful of covetousness is the last of the Ten Commandments. I don't think it's, it means it's the least important. I think it undergirds all the other commandments. He said, thou shalt not covet. He said covetousness, if you compare one another about what the person has or has not, if in your heart you always say, I must get the latest gadget to bring me happiness, that is my intrinsic uh, good is, is about buying and selling, uh, buying things and having things. The Bible says the love of money is the root of all evil. Now, I'm not saying money is not important. I see watch out for my, my pay slip right, at the end of the month to pay things and so on. But where is our heart? Who is the Lord of your life? You know, all these are what Paul wants us to say, watch out, lest you be captured by human philosophy or by empty deceit that... Money is everything that brings you happiness. That's about life. And Jesus said, no, life does not consist in the abundance of your possessions. And finally, I just want to touch on the last two philosophies. New Age, you know, is the next uh, sort of philosophy that the world has. And sometimes when you go witnessing, they say, I'm part of God. You know, cosmos. God is in the whole cosmos. And uh, God is in everything, and He is everything. And I, being part of the cosmos, I'm God, part of God. And I have to discover my part as God by going into a higher state of consciousness through meditation. You see, New Age believe that you can, uh, that if you have your consciousness elevated, you can travel through space, time, and morality all disappear. And Shirley MacLaine, in her book, say, Dancing in the Light, she says, know that you are God. Know that you are the universe. And she said, I recall, ten, uh, I've lived a thousand lives. I was a harem dancer. I was a monk meditating in a cave. I was a ballet dancer in Russia. I was an Inca youth. Another book, I can't remember the name, she wrote about this. I saw this high vase of ashes, and there was a grandfather, and there was a grand, uh, granddaughter. She said, I was both. Now, what I'm saying new age is that, hey, is there an impact in our Christian life? New ageism can also creep into the church. You know, they believe in channeling. And we need to be very careful about spiritual guides. 
even visualization. So we need to test everything in the church. Of course, we believe in both the natural and the supernatural. And finally, we talk about atheism. Can it be that even atheism infiltrate the church? And the answer is yes. Why? Because we have Christian atheists. Have you heard of Christian atheists? Christian on Sunday, atheists on the rest of the days, which I've described, so I'm going to follow, uh, to, to talk more about it. But basically, Paul says, I'm not asking you to follow philosophy. I'm asking you to follow Jesus Christ, just as you received him. He said, walk in him. Have your joy, have your satisfaction, abounding, another metaphor of river overflowing its banks, of thankfulness. He is your satisfaction. He is our sufficiency. And that you are filled in Him. You do not have any that is lacking. There's no gap in you that you need anything else to fill you. But Jesus Himself. He is eternal. He is absolute. He is, a, he is love. He is a reference point. All that we live is actually tied to Him as the Lord, head of uh, the rule over all in authority. And He's the one that we need to build up our faith. He's the one that we make sure that we do not have gaps in our worldview. And it is Him that we need divine revelation, not human philosophies. And we have that fullness, sufficiencies in Him. We are complete in Him. That's why the verse says, you are filled in Him. Remember the verse? Filled in Him. Let's read. For in Him the whole fullness of deity dwells bodily, and you have been filled in Him, who is the head of all rule and authority. And ultimately, we go back to Him. And He is with us. So I want to encourage all of us, you know, to challenge our worldview. Is your, whole, is your worldview coherent and consistent? You see, it's important. What are your priorities in life? Is that aligned to what Jesus says? Next week, we'll talk about the bigger worldview. How much are you influenced by other philosophies? Are you taken captive by hedonistic tendencies, by addictions, even, you know, video games at night, you know, don't sleep and so on. It's about meeting your pleasure, not obeying God. Succumb to your feelings rather than succumb to your will to say, I choose not to indulge in this addiction or pornography or whatever. Of course, there are some psychological reasons and so on, but in the end, it's about what is driving you, what makes it what are the priorities in your life? And finally, ask yourself, do you compartmentalize your life? Spiritual upstairs, physical downstairs, and the twain shall never meet except on Sunday or cell days. So let's spend a couple of minutes just to reflect and ask the Holy Spirit to speak to us and say, Lord, I want to be a wholesome person. I want to be filled in, in Christ Jesus, filled in Him. Why filled in Him? Why there's no gap? Because Jesus wants us to be a pure bride. He doesn't want any part of you to be shared with any false gods. Just like, you know, pure water. He doesn't want any to be, his water to be adulterated with poisons because of his love for us. He gave himself completely to us and he expects us to be filled in him. So let's meditate on the, the, uh, the passage we have today and what the Spirit of God have challenged us.